standing there, uh, only one thing came to my mind. I think we're here to do church. <laughs> uh, that was great. Uh, I, I was ready to just keep going. Uh, it, it has been such a privilege and honor to share with you over these last uh, three weeks. And whether you're here or you're online, uh, it, it has really been uh, one of those things that marks your years of ministry. Uh, sometimes people will come up and they'll say, well, you really stomped on my toes today, preacher. And, and what you've got to understand when preachers prepare, before they ever get up to tell you and stomp on your toes, their toes are bloodied. Okay, All week, we get bloodied when we're in before the Lord trying to get a message from him to share with his people. And it has been a great privilege and honor to be with you uh, these four weeks. We have tried to put together a big picture of reality uh, so that we can understand what's going on in our world, what's going on in our lives. And, and that big picture of reality has shaped our beliefs about God and uh, creation and everything else. And, and we've looked at sort of three chapters of God's big story for mankind. We tried to understand creation. Why did he create everything? Why was man created in his image? Then, then we looked at what happened with the fall. And, and how is that still impacting us each and every day? And then we had that great good news yet last week, trying to understand redemption, where our purpose, our significance was restored by Jesus Christ coming and dying on the cross for our sins and then raised up to walk in newness of life. And what I want to do today, I want to go and bring some application to the big story that we've tried to lay out these last three weeks. Uh, how do we apply this to everyday life? How is this, since God has us here to hear these things, how is it supposed to shape us and change us and use us for his glory? I would say this message is on fulfilling the purpose. The first three, we're trying to understand and see God's purpose. Now, how do we fulfill it? And we know from our study that man was created in God's image for two reasons. To know him intimately and personally. I hope this past week you've gotten to know your heavenly father so that you could sing that song we just sung with gusto, with, with enthusiasm, because you've spent time to know him, and that you glorify him. We've got to understand how important it is that we are here to glorify God. Jonathan Edwards says this, God makes the duty of men. Let's, let's make it personal. Put your name in there. God makes the duty of Glenn Schultz. God makes the duty of you to do what? That they should desire and seek God's glory as their highest end in whatever they do. That's what he wants for me. Most of us know this verse out of uh, 1 Corinthians 10.31, where it says, whether then you eat or drink or whatever you do. Now let me pause. I just want to do a quick view here, whether you're online or up there on the shelf or down here. I want to see if there's anybody. Is there anybody here you do something other than whatever you do? Boy, you're looking at me. Now, wait a minute. I, the 8 o'clock, you know, 9 o'clock group, they got it quicker than you did, you know. <laughs> Come on now. This is, this is the 11 o'clock hour. You say, well, no, there's nothing that I do that's not whatever I do. I want you to really internalize that. God is really saying, it doesn't matter what you do. Do it for my glory. And we've got to understand that. I would say that most Christians that I talk to, if I were to ask them, do you want to see God work in your life? They immediately say, oh, yes. But do we understand what would cause God to work and not work in our lives? 
Because what we've got to understand, God will only work for his glory. That's what scripture tells us. If you look at Isaiah chapter 42, verse 8, God through the prophet Isaiah says, I am the Lord, that is my name, I will not give my glory to anyone. It's for me. If you go further into Isaiah chapter 11, uh, 48, verse 11, he says, for my own sake I will act. Do you realize God acts for his sake? He, he acts for who he is, for his name's sake. You find that throughout scripture. For how can my name be profaned? He says, I will not allow my great name to be profaned. And my glory I will not give to another. So we are to do everything for God's glory. We are to glorify him. So here's the question. What does it mean to glorify God? What I have found in my walk with the Lord over the years, I was taught to memorize scripture. I, I was taught verses like 1 Corinthians 10, 31, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all the glory of God. And I memorized those things. And I would say, if someone would say, do you believe God's word to be true? I'd say, oh yes, I believe that to be true. Okay, what does it mean to glorify God? And then I would just sort of stare at them. Because no one ever taught me what it meant. So what does it mean to glorify God? Does that mean that after you score a touchdown, you point to heaven and take a knee? Is that what it is? Uh, does it mean that when you go into a restaurant, before you eat, you bow and say a prayer? Is that glorifying God? Well, if I came to you and said, okay, tell me what it is to glorify God so I could do it, what would you tell me? Is it to just meditate on his majesty and not say anything, just sit there in awe? See, sometimes we need to understand what we're told is our purpose in a way that will help us actually do it. Dr. Gary Inrig was a man that I was studying his works, and, and he said this, to glorify someone is to increase that person's reputation by revealing his true nature. See, if you want to glorify me, what you have to do is you have to go out and represent. That term, represent, it means represent. You know me, so you represent me to others. And you're supposed to do that to build my reputation, to reveal my real character. So Inrig puts it this way when it comes to glorifying God. He says to glorify God is to live your life in such a way that you actually reveal God's character, which causes, in turn, God's praise to be increased. Now that I can understand. That I can say, okay, now I know what it means to glorify God. I am supposed to be a reflection of his attributes. Now, let me put you through a little mind game. And I want you to participate because I think it'll get the point across. I want you to imagine you're at your favorite team's game, okay? Your favorite team in all the world, they're called the Angels. And you are at their game, and they're playing their terrible rival across the street, ungodly people, they're the devils, okay? So your team, the Angels, is playing the devils, and it's a nip and tuck game, and right before the final whistle, a man in a striped shirt who must have been an atheist makes a bad call that causes your angels to lose to the devils and you want to voice your godly love to that official. <laughs> now you're laughing because you don't voice your godly love to that official, do you? But guess what? How you respond to that as a coach, as a player, as a fan is covered in that verse, whatever you do. And you're supposed to respond in a way that reflects God's character that would cause that referee to increase God's praise. 
See, glorifying God is not just a little trite saying. It means that how you live your life, you are telling the world, this is what God is like. And God says, I've made you in my image to reflect me, to give me glory. Now, in order to give God glory, there's something else we've got to understand. We've got to understand the glory of God. If I'm going to glorify God, I must understand the glory of God. When I was a boy growing up, it didn't matter what church I visited or I was in. Somewhere in that church building was a picture like this. Back then, this picture was the most common picture in churches. It's Jesus standing outside a door. There's no handle on the door, and he's knocking. And people in church told me, Glenn, that's Jesus knocking at your heart door. And if you open it, he'll come in and save you. Now that I've read it in context of what it says in Revelation chapter 3, this is really a picture of Jesus outside the church of Laodicea. In fact, the church of Laodicea had moved God out of their midst. And he was saying, I want to knock on the door of the church and I want my people to open the door and I want to come in and have communion with them at a table. The verse in Revelation 3 actually says this, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and dine with him. Now, if you were to ask someone over to your house and say, we want you to come to our house and we want you to dine with us. They are going to come with the picture in mind that we're going to sit at a table and we're going to eat together. We're not going to stand up at different rooms in the house. No, we're going to be together at a table and we're going to dine together and there's going to be fellowship and communion. And this is so important for us to understand the glory of God. We have to be in his presence in close fellowship to see his glory. See, God's presence reveals his glory. That's what Hebrews 1.3 tells us, that when Jesus came to this earth, he was the brightness of God's glory and express image of his person. And so what we have to realize, if we're going to fulfill our purpose and glorify God, we've got to understand that one's glory is one's reputation. God's glory is not just his reputation, but his revealed character, the display of his attributes. That's God's glory. And whether we're reading his one book, the book of creation, because we know creation is an expression of who he is, we can see his attributes, or whether we're reading his written word, in there it reveals to us his attributes so we can have fellowship with him and communion with him, either in the book that he's written or in creation, and we can go and say, okay, now God, I see your glory. I understand your attributes. That's what's so important. God's presence reveals God's glory. But there's a problem. We can be separated from God's presence where we don't see his glory, and when we don't see God's glory, we cannot reflect his character. So therefore, we do not fulfill his purpose of glorifying him. Glorifying God hinges on our time alone with God. If we're not in his presence, we don't see his glory. We have to understand there are things in our life that will literally separate us from God's presence. The most grievous one is sin itself. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, it says that they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden. Adam and his wife hid themselves 
from the presence of the Lord. If you and I have unconfessed sin in our lives, we will have guilt and shame whenever we're in the presence of the Lord and we'll try to hide from Him. I, I, I know people who they fell into sin and one of the first things they did is stop coming to church. And that's the last thing they should have done. Why did they stop coming to church? Because there was guilt and shame and they didn't want to be in God's presence. Or they, they pulled away from their Christian friends. Why? Because of sin and shame. And so we've got to understand, we've got to confess sin. He's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us of that unrighteousness so we can get back into his presence. There's also self-sufficiency that keeps us away from the presence of God. See, Laodicea was probably one of the wealthiest cities in the world at that time. They were a clothing manufacturer par none. I mean, they were the Neiman Marcus of their day. They dressed in regal attire. And they also had advanced eye care where people would travel around the world to come to Laodicea so they could get their eyes worked on and they could have good vision. But the problem was they became self-sufficient. They didn't need God anymore. It says in Revelation 3.17... Jesus saying to this church in Laodicea, you say you're rich and you become wealthy and you have need of nothing. You've got great eyesight. You've got great clothes. You're rich and guess what? He says, you're wretched. You're miserable. You're poor. You're blind. You're naked. Self-sufficiency keeps you from going to God. When I started teaching 53 years ago as a young 20-year-old, Uh, junior and seniors in chemistry. I I had no education classes. I didn't know anything about education. I never student taught. And guess what? That first year, I prayed about every 10 or 15 seconds. God, help me. I can't do this. God, give me wisdom. I don't even understand this subject, and I've got to teach it. You know, I was praying and praying and praying. All of a sudden, I realized God had given me the gift of teaching. And my students started really uh, excelling in chemistry, and they were blowing the doors off of the state chemistry regents exam. 97% of my students passed that exam. The state average was 82%. I found out I was a very good teacher. But guess what? I didn't pray as much. I didn't need God. Boy, I had the gift of teaching. I could make a lesson come alive. Self-sufficiency keeps us from the presence of God. There's one other thing that will keep you from the presence of God. Probably no one in here deals with this. (laughs) Busyness. Are you busy? (laughs) Boy, we don't have time to do anything. Satan loves to keep us busy. Because when you're busy, you don't have time for God. In fact... There have been times in my life I've been so busy in my work for God that I didn't have time for Him. Busyness keeps us away. Mary wasn't busy. Mary sat at Jesus' feet and heard His word. Martha, she was distracted with much serving and didn't hear a word Jesus said. This past week, how much time have you spent at the feet of Jesus hearing his word? How many times have you been distracted by busyness and never heard a word he was trying to tell you? See, we've got to understand that. God's glory is so important. And to understand it is so critical. And you have to be with him to do it. We're going to watch this little video clip, dear friend of mine, Pastor James McManus in uh, Louisiana. And as you listen to it, I just title it, Daddy, Sit Down. And I think you'll understand why I call this clip that. But listen to it and put yourself and say, where am I in this idea of needing Daddy to sit down? 
reconciliation is not only what I've been saved from, it's what I've been saved to. You've been saved to the glory of God. That's his presence. And that's what the table throughout the Bible is all about. We're going to get into it in the next few weeks. You know, I was thinking about this in, in, in preparation, and I was reminded that when my son, my first son, was like two years old, back at that time I was traveling a lot. I was preaching in Houston and in Dallas, and, and we, our church was uh, much smaller. I mean, we had maybe 40 members then. And, and I had one pair of dress shoes, and they were these black dress shoes, all right? As, and it was, and no matter what color suit I wore, I had to wear, I wore black shoes. No matter if that was in style or what, black shoes is what I had. So that's what you had to deal with, all right? So I'd put them black shoes on, and my little son, two years old, James Christian, he would come to me and he'd say, Daddy, take the black shoes off. <laughs> take the black shoes off. Because he knew when Daddy put on them black devil stomping gospel preaching shoes that that mean I, I was likely heading somewhere. And so he associated the black shoes with me leaving. And he said, Daddy, take the black shoes off. Take the black shoes off. And then he would come behind that, and this is what he would say all the time. He'd say this all the time. He'd say, Daddy, sit down. He said, Daddy, sit down. Daddy, sit down. And he'd be playing with these little choo-choo tracks, those Thomas the Train, the wooden choo-choo tracks. And he'd be playing with them, and he'd make his little circle and put a little Thomas on there. But he knew when Daddy sat down, Man, I'd put the figure eight, you know, on there. And I might do something else with the train. I got the overpass on the train, you know. I'm doing stuff with the train tracks that he, his little two-year-old mind wasn't able to do just yet. And, and, and so if the battery wasn't quite right in Thomas and Thomas wouldn't work right, I could open Thomas up with a screwdriver and put that battery in there just right. And all of a sudden, Thomas is going back like he need to again. And a little bell on the choo-choo chain when it, by, when it wasn't working. Daddy could fix that. And so it wasn't that just Daddy could fix things. He just wanted to be with Daddy. But in his mind, daddy, sit down. Black shoes means daddy, leave. Daddy, take the black shoes off. Daddy, sit down. Daddy, sit down. And, and so I was so moved by that because I'm just now be becoming a parent at this point. Christian and I, this is our firstborn. I was so moved by that that the Lord really began to deal with me. And I was like, am I ever saying to my daddy, God, my father, sit down. Daddy, sit down. Daddy, sit down because your hands are bigger than mine. And you can do things I can't do. And you're smarter than I am. And you can work things out I can't figure out. And you're wiser than I am. And you can put things together. And you see the bigger picture. And you know that if you'll put this many pieces of the wooden track together they'll eventually meet back up right over here but I'm just two I can't figure that out yet how that job change is going to work out for my good over here and the reason I had to get laid off over here was because you're going to put me over here and while I'm over here I'm going to meet somebody and that's going to turn into something I couldn't see how all that could work out but God is able daddy sit down daddy sit down sit down daddy I can get things worked out when my father's sitting down with me in his presence, my son wanted the glory of who I am. That's the same reason my wife and I go on a date every week. I want the glory of who she is. <laughs> go ahead. Give the Lord a hand. Folks, we need to have Daddy sit down with us every day. We need to spend time in his presence to see his glory. And then we can fulfill our purpose by reflecting his character in all we think, say, and do. It was at this point of going through this material with the staff that a common question started coming up, which I think is probably going through some people's minds either here or out, out there uh, in computer land someplace. You think, oh, all this blessedness and how God has redeemed me and, and all this stuff. But you know what? I, I tried to do some of this. I, I mean, I did it for three days and then I started, I, I just slid back into my old routines. And, and things I didn't want to do anymore, I found myself doing them again. And, and the question comes up is, okay, if this is God's purpose, why is it so hard? Why is it so, you know, I, I understand the fall brought sin and heartache and everything into this world, but I've been redeemed, so why am I still battling this? It's because when God saved me, he didn't just reform my old flesh. He gave me a brand new nature. 
but my flesh is still there. What we've got to understand, if we're going to fulfill God's purpose, every day we're here on this earth until he returns, we have to be engaged in a battle. Now, now before we, we look at the battle, I want you to understand God's promise. In 2 Peter 1.3, it says that his divine power, God's divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Now, do you understand what he's saying there? What God's word is saying is the same power that allowed him to speak this universe into existence out of nothing is the same power that gives you and me as born-again Christians everything that pertains to live a godly life. So to say we can't live a godly life is a fallacy because the power of the creator of this universe is the same power that gives us everything that pertains to life and godliness. But there's a battle. And, and to think that you're the only one that faces it is ignorance. I am so glad that God's word <laughs> shows that even the writers of scripture were people just like you and me. The apostle Paul in Romans do you ever sound like this? Paul cries out, For what I am doing I do not understand, for I am not practicing what I would like to do, but I am doing the very thing I hate. Do you ever feel that way? Paul did. He went on and he even said this, For I know that nothing good dwells in me and my flesh. See, Paul understood he still had his old man in him. The old nature, the flesh. The, those are the terms you find in Scripture. He still had that. And he knew that there is nothing good in his flesh. There is nothing good in my flesh. My old nature, my sinful nature. My, any acts of goodness are like filthy rags in the eyes of a holy God. And he says, for the good that I want, I do not do, but I practice the very evil that I do not want. And then he said this, wretched man that I am, who will set me free from this body of death? How am I ever going to win this? How am I going to get overcome with this old fleshly nature? Well, there's good news. There's some strategies that you and I can do each and every day that will allow us not to be under the control of the flesh, but under our divine nature that we have to live godly lives. See, Paul said something in Romans chapter 6 where he says, Do not let sin reign in your life, in your mortal body, so that you obey its lust. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. See, you can get all frustrated and say, you know, Lord, I, I want to do what's right, but I keep doing those things I hate to do. But then at the same time, you'll let your eyes look at things that are unrighteous. You'll listen to music and other things that don't line up with God's word. You'll let your feet take you to places that you know you shouldn't be at. Or let your hands do things that God doesn't want them to do anymore. You've yielded your members of your body to unrighteousness. God says, no, I've redeemed you. You know, you present your members of your body as instruments of righteousness. So I'm going to quickly go through a series of strategies that I have found in Scripture that actually help me win the battle so the old man in me doesn't come out. Now, again, don't go talk to my wife about this because she has seen the old man. It does come out. I struggle, just like you struggle. There is no one that has become perfect. Here's some strategies we've got to understand. Number one, you've got to get your blood circulating. If you know anything about the human heart, and you know anything about blood, the Bible says life is in the blood. Uh, the blood carries oxygen to the members of the body, to the extremities, so that you can what? So that you can live. 
And, and if blood does not get to the brain or blood does not get down to a toe or out to a finger, if the blood doesn't get there, that extremity could eventually actually die and become useless. So Paul in Philippians chapter 2 says, Beloved, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Now, now, here's not what he's saying. He is not saying work for your salvation. You can't do anything to appease a holy God. It took the blood of Jesus Christ to pay for my sin. My works don't save me. It cannot save me. But what he's saying is, when I became a Christian, it was a heart issue. He gave me a new heart. I had a divine nature in me now. And God says, okay, Glenn, it's your responsibility to make sure what I've done in your heart gets to your hands, gets to your feet, gets to your eyes, your ears, your mouth. It's your responsibility to work that through your body so it's flowing, so that spiritual blood is giving you vitality and you're living the Christian life. We've got to get our blood circulating. Number two, we've got to get rid of stinking thinking. When I was born, I was born with a depraved mind. I was not capable of thinking good things. And in my flesh, I still think bad things. I'm negative by nature. And Paul, in Romans chapter 12, he said, don't be conformed to the old world anymore. Be transformed. Go from being a caterpillar to a butterfly. By what? By renewing the mind. We've got to think differently now that we're born again. Now that we understand our purpose and we see everything in a whole. But it's a spiritual warfare. Paul in 2 Corinthians 10 Verse 3, he says, we, we wrestle, we struggle in a battle, but it's a spiritual battle. And what we have to do is we've got to pull down all those thoughts, all those things that go against the mind of, of God. And we've got to take every thought about every area of life and make it obedient to this book. Now, the Bible says, make it obedience to Christ. But John 1.1 1, 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was Christ. So when it says obedience to Christ, it's saying obedience to here. Every area of your life now is sacred to God. There is no dualism. Remember we talked about that. Everything has to be brought under the obedience of this book. If you go to verse 6, it even says... When you find something in your life that you're thinking wrong, you've got to deal with it as disobedience and bring it under captivity. We've got to get rid of stinking thinking. Another strategy. We've got to start exercising. Now, I know that's a dirty word to a lot of people. Now, now physical exercise is good, and I do it once in a while. In fact, I enjoy Running, I can watch it for hours. And, you know, you, <laughs> and, and I could bring someone up here who could be maybe smaller than me and younger than me, and I could give them a 30-pound uh, barbell, and they can sit there and they could curl it many times. Why? Because they have exercised that muscle, so now they can handle that weight. Where if you gave me the 30 pounds, I could maybe get it up once because I haven't exercised this muscle. That happens to us spiritually. The writer in Hebrews was telling the people, the Christians back then, that they should be teachers of truth. But they were still immature, and they still needed milk. They weren't ready for good meat. And he went and he wrote and said, but strong meat belongs to them that are of full age, even those by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Do you ever wonder why some people seem to always avoid temptation? They, they don't even get close to it. You know why? Because they've taken the principles in this book 
and they've actually lived them out. They've exercised them. They've used them, and they've actually exercised and strengthened their spiritual discernment muscles so that when they get into a situation, right away it says, "Uh uh-oh, bad, got to get away from that. Flee youthful lust, the Bible says. See, they don't get into it because why? They have discernment. But when we never use this book and we never follow its principles and never apply them to everyday life, we're weak and therefore we fall into sin. How's your exercise routine spiritually? Here's one. It's time to change our clothes. It's time to get dressed up. Uh, I can remember I used to do a chapel message in Christian schools And I'd announce it ahead of time. And I told them that we're going to come and talk about what the Bible's dress code. And oh boy, oh, the kids would get so upset. Uh, You know, because back when I started in Christian school education, you know, everybody had found the picture of a boy's haircut in Hezekiah chapter 3. And uh, in third Ruth, they, they had skirt length. And so everything was all patterned. But you know what? We're not talking about the outward dress. When I was a teenage boy, I worked on a migrant farm, and we raised about 250 acres of sweet corn and cabbage up in western New York. And and every once in a while, I got assigned to moving irrigation lines. And what that meant back then, it was before they had all these mechanism ones, after uh, the pipes uh, irrigated for two hours, then we had to drain them, and we had to move them so far down the field. And, you know, you're, you're ankle deep in mud, and, and by the time pipes every two to four hours, I, I was just filthy. And when I had those dirty clothes on and I stunk with sweat, guess what? I didn't want to see anybody. I didn't want to talk with anybody. All I want to do is get home, get a good bath, and get some clean clothes on. Then I was ready for people. That's what we've got to do spiritually. See, what happens, we're born with dirty clothes. The old man is clothed with things, some garments we've got to get rid of and put some clean clothes on. We find this in Colossians chapter 3. Paul again is the writer and he says, here's the garments you need to take off. Take off the garments of the old man, anger, wrath, malice, slander, abusive speech, lying to one another, gossip. Take those garments off. You're new in Christ. Don't wear them anymore. Put on some clean clothes. Put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another, forgiving each other. Would our world change if we changed our clothes? See, I've had this picture for years. Just like you get up each morning and you have to go to your closet and decide what you're going to put on. My wife will ask me if I've taken the dog out. She says, well, what's the weather like? Is it humid? Is it cool? What is it? So she knows what to put on. Every morning when you get up, you've got a choice. You've got a choice there. Are you going to put the garments of the old man on or are you going to put the garments of the new man on? And what you put on in the morning is going to determine how you treat other people, how you respect God how you glorify him. It's time to change our clothes. It's also time to change direction. When when I, again, was born and I was growing up and I wasn't a Christian, and even after I'm a Christian, I still find myself walking in the flesh, it says in the Bible. I'm walking according to my earthly lust, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. I'm walking in the flesh. And God says, no, as a new creature, don't walk that way anymore. You need to go and walk in the spirit. I've got to have the spirit in control of me. I've got to have the fruit of, of the spirit in my life. I've got to walk in his path. Quit walking the way of the world. We've got to do that. Another big one. It's time to change your diet. Now, when someone comes up to me and says, uh, you know, because you, you've all heard this, that a person is what they eat, right? We, we, we say that a lot. When a person comes up to me and says, you know what, I, I don't believe in this false stuff. I don't believe in sin. I don't believe in evil. And all I tell them is, well, then answer this question for me. 
why does fat and sugar taste so good? Because that's bad for you. You're not supposed to eat those things. And yet it tastes so good. I think it's a result of the fall. That's my own thing. And they tell me as I get older, I've got to eat healthy. What do you hunger and thirst for? Jesus said, you want to be happy? You want to be blessed? Hunger and thirst for my righteousness. You know, when you're hungry and thirsty, it, it's one of three things that can prove. Number one, if you're hungry, it proves you're alive. Do you realize dead people don't hunger? They're not thirsty. I mean, you can put a delicious ribeye steak just off the grill in front of them, and they won't even get up out of the casket. <laughs> it's a sign of life. It's also a sign of health. You probably have been in that situation or know someone who they lost their appetite when they were sick. And as soon as they gain the appetite back, what's the doctor say? Oh, they're on their way to recovery. Why? Because they see an appetite for food and water. It can also mean a sign of fatigue. When you work hard, guess what? You get hungry. You get thirsty. I want to ask you something. Do you hunger and thirst for this? If you don't, could it mean that you're dead spiritually? That you need Jesus Christ? You need a relationship with a living God and drink living waters? Are you alive in Christ? If you're not hungry for this, does that mean that you're not healthy? That there's something in your life that's keeping you spiritually sick? Or maybe you're just fatigued and you just need time alone with the Lord to restore your strength so you hunger and thirst for righteousness. What's your diet like? Another one. Make sure you're fighting on the winning side. Remember in week one, if you were here, we said that to God, all of life, there's no secular sacred divide. All of life, God wants under his control. Every area of my life, from media to education to science to politics to government, it doesn't matter what area of my life, God says it's all mine. I created it in you. I want to control it. But there is also the kingdom of darkness that's trying to control. That's why Jesus said, no, you need to seek first, number one in your life, my kingdom. Now, when you say seek God's kingdom, here's what it means. You need to seek God's reign in your life. He is supposed to be king of all of your life. And what you've got to understand is he's not king of your life unless you obey his rules. They're here for your good. They're not here to take away our joy and peace. It, it, it's a blessing. And, and if we want his kingdom, now I, I want to let you know, if you take this journey all the way, it's going to not just blow your mind, it's going to blow up your life. You won't even enjoy television anymore. Because guess what you'll see? You'll see the world's ways and, and you're in a battle all the time. You, you'll have to look at government differently. you have to look at police differently. You, a lot of people will say, oh, Christians shouldn't be involved in politics. Politics is a part of my life that God created. God wants to reign in it. So what do I do? I, I, whether I'm voting for a dog catcher, I vote for ideas. That's what you do when you vote. You're saying, I want those ideas to run my life. Guess what? I want these ideas to run my life. So I'm going to vote in line with this. Now that puts me in trouble with some of my friends, puts me in trouble with other friends. Why? Because we go by personalities, we go by color of skin, we go by all these things, where God says, no, 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 just, just obey my word. See, we have got to fight on the winning side. One more thing. Tap into God's power. Let me tell you the truth. 
it's not hard to live the Christian life. It's impossible. I can't live it. I hope that doesn't you know, blow your mind too much. You say, but you're preaching. Uh, but I still can't do it. If I try to do it in my effort, I, I fail all the time. Because I don't have the power to live the godly life. The only one who had the power to live the godly life was Jesus Christ. He came. He was the written word, and he came and became the living word. And he showed only he can live this. And then he sent a duplicate of himself, the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, to indwell me and empower me. And if I don't allow him to work through me, I can't live the Christian life. Neither can you. See, Paul said, for this purpose also I labor. I do the grunt work, striving according to God's power, which mightily works in me. Paul couldn't do it either. Here's a summary statement that I hope will help all of you right now. Alistair McGrath said this, With each, within each one of us that's here live or watching online, each one of us, there exists the image of God, however disfigured and corrupted by sin it may presently be. But God is able to recover that image through grace and conform us into the image of his dear son. That deserves an amen, I think. Amen. So wherever you are, if you don't know Christ, God's grace can save you and you can get on this journey. If you're on the journey and you're struggling, just remember, no matter how marred the image is, it's not beyond God's grace to be able to restore it and make you like Jesus Christ. So here are this week's points to think about. How well do you know God and see his glory? What keeps you from being in God's presence the most? What times have you not glorified God by not reflecting his nature? What were the consequences? Can you think of a time when you were dealing with a bad situation and you did respond in a way that revealed his character? What consequences did you face then? Have you been in a situation when you gave into the flesh like Paul and said, oh, that's the very opposite I wanted to do in that situation. Why did I strike out in anger? What areas in your life are your thoughts not in line with God's word? Is your spiritual blood circulating throughout your entire body? And of these strategies, what strategies is the Holy Spirit telling you right now that you need to focus on today, tomorrow, throughout the week, so that you can actually win the battle between the old man, the flesh, and the new man, God's divine nature that he gives us with all of his power so we can live godly lives. Ponder those as we listen to this song.